Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Characterising Groundwater Flow Velocity and Preferential Flow Zones Using the Colloidal Boroscope. Last year in September we ran a series of seminars around the country that many of you attended. Part of Rob Gingell's um, presentation was on the colloidal boroscope. At the time this generated a great deal of interest, so as a follow-up today we're pleased to have Rob back with us to give a presentation and demonstration of the Geotech colloidal boroscope. Uh, and we now have this equipment available for hire and sales through AMI. I'll now hand over to Rob Gingell, the Global Business Development Manager from Geotech. Good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Gingell. I'm the Global Business Development Manager for Geotech Environmental Equipment. Uh, our headquarters is based in Denver, Colorado. And as Peter mentioned, uh, we are doing a follow-up today uh, based on the feedback that we had, a uh, positive response during our road trip in September. Um, as Peter mentioned, it is available for hire or sale uh, in Australia now. But uh, I'd like to begin by um, with my presentation by, uh, if, you, if you look on your screen, you'll see uh, that's our headquarters in Denver, Colorado. Geotech was founded in 1978. Uh, they worked in conjunction with the USGS to develop bladder pumps as part of the trace metals analysis program um, here in the U.S. So that's how we got our start, and we've been in business for over 30 years now. And uh, we're working with AirMet Australia-wide, and uh, they're a great partner for us. So feel free to give those guys a call if you need anything. Okay. Today we're going to be dis discussing uh, groundwater direction, velocity, uh, and hydraulic conductivity. Well, the first graph up you see up here uh, basically shows two aquifers, uh, aquifer A and aquifer B. Uh, you'll notice that the surface of aquifer B is higher than that of aquifer A. Uh, there's an upward vertical gradient present in the area of the fault. And if you can see uh, in the different wells that you have here, Obviously, you've got a different potentiometric surface due to the recharge uh, being higher in one aquifer than the other. And through these, through this presentation, we're going to we're going to show you a, a variety of different characteristics uh, of aquifers that may change the direction and the velocity of the flow, and and how this instrument can be used as an advantage versus traditional some of the traditional methods that are used for measuring uh, groundwater velocity. So a lot of what is dependent on how the water moves underground is based on hydraulic conductivity and hydraulic gradients. The radian distance over time, meters per second at which uh, water moves through a permeable uh, medium, can be measured using aquifer test or can use literal values. Uh, one thing to note is that gravel and sand have higher conductivity and clays and shale have uh, lower hydraulic conductivity. And the more coarse the medium, the higher the conductivity. Uh, so characterizing groundwater flow and velocity uh, with a boroscope is what we'll discuss next. Um, why do you characterize groundwater flow? A lot of what we're doing is to plan efficient remediation. Uh, it can show the extent of contaminants in the ground. It can define exposure routes, define flow velocity, and then uh, you can identify and assess risk and establish a plan for remediation. The criteria for characterizing groundwater flow, uh, a lot of it is based on site geology, uh, the rate and direction of the groundwater flow, and then based on that, uh, the contaminants present, the concentration of the contaminants, uh, and the vertical and lateral extent of contaminants. As, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a number of different methods for characterizing ground flow. Uh, you have your historical boring laws. Uh, you can take groundwater level measurements, use potentiometric maps, uh, well clusters that are screened at different depths uh, around the site, uh, and tracer tests are relatively popular. Uh, what you get when you're doing these different types of tests is that uh, you might have a general idea of where the water may be moving based on uh, characteristics of, of what you might perceive as underground. Um, but what is unique about this instrument is that it actually takes a real-time reading of velocity and direction underground, uh, and it can be done within uh, a single well. Obviously, if you're looking at a site, you're, wanna, you're probably going to want to take readings at uh, multiple depths at multiple wells. Uh, but in general, if you put this instrument down a well, and you find the area of uh, preferential flow, uh, you're going to get you're going to get a good reading. How this works? It directly observes groundwater flow velocity. Uh, in groundwater, there's naturally 
occurring colloids, which are neutrally buoyant. What this instrument does is it, it basically measures flow uh, at the depths that you select from individual fractures. Uh, it allows you to capture an aerial and vertical distribution of groundwater flow velocities um, that can then be interpreted. Why is it better? Uh, well, one of the main reasons that it's better uh, is that it is easy to use. Uh, basically, you know, as I mentioned, you, you drop it down a well, and you don't have to go to multiple wells and take different readings and review logs and things that you would might try to do if you are if you're using a water level meter. You're not going to have the inconsistencies that you may have if you're doing tracer tests uh, and things such as that. And so, what we have here, uh, if you look at the bottom you see that we have an LED lamp. It's a sapphire lens on both sides. At the top of the bore scope, there is basically a compass, an azimuth. It's a flux gate, gate compass. And then you will have uh, a camera and your magnifying lenses. And uh, basically right here in this area is your field of view. So as the particles move through this field of view, as you're using it in a well, uh, it will pick up the particles and it will track their direction and velocity. This is just kind of a general overview of the, what the software would look like on your computer screen. Uh, if you look at the two different, there's two different particles. You have an alpha particle and a beta particle. What the instrument does is it tracks these particles and then it measures the velocity and the direction that they're going. You can see in the yellow. And from there, it'll basically, it'll give you, um, it'll give you a direction based on a compass heading from 0 to 360, 0 being north, 180 degrees being south, uh, that will let you know the direction that the water is flowing. Uh, in this area here, you will see uh, that there are some particles that are being shown on the screen, and that's basically, this is just a snapshot of the particles, and basically what it's doing is it's taking a couple shots of, of the particles and tracking the directions that they're moving underground. The minimum particle size that it will detect is uh, 1 micron. There is, uh, if, I can, if I can get a good enough angle on it, you'll see I can adjust the intensity of the lamp. This is going to be the highest, and I can turn it down lower. What that allows you to do is if you are in a, the cleaner the water, uh, the, lower, the lower lamp uh, brightness that you would need to, to use, but it also allows you to, to turn it up if you're in a situation where you have a more turbid sample uh, to allow you to get a better reading on uh, specific particles. On this particular screen here, uh, it's just a, a basic well. What this is showing is your velocity is in blue and your direction is in red. So if we're looking here, if you're looking, it looks like, you know, it's basically a northwest flow uh, with a velocity of about 250 um, micrometers per minute. Uh, how that translates uh, is into micrometers per second. Uh, you can get that to transfer over into feed per day. Uh, it will give you an average velocity, a median velocity, velocity, and minimum, minimum velocity. So it, it provides really, really useful data. Just another uh, diagram or photo of uh, installation. Uh, with this is representing is the all of the work and the testing that was done on this was done at the uh, Oak Ridge National Labs in Tennessee. Uh, this is just basically a mock-up here uh, where they where they did some analysis to uh, develop the curves to ensure uh, that the proper testing was done to develop the, uh, the speed and the direction uh, software for this instrument. Here it's the same thing. This, as you can see down here, anything that has the ORNL. Uh, these are different types of tests that were done, different size. Uh, wells were being tested, different penetrations, different types of packs, sand packs, et cetera. This is uh, analysis that was done uh, using a tracer test, sodium chloride, which is which this one was done uh, comparative to, to get some data. And then we have a wide variety of different screens here over the next four. Uh, let me go back one, excuse me. So if you're looking at a screen such as this, you see you have your velocity here and your direction here. Uh, what you're looking for when you're trying to find preferential flow is a really tight cropping of data points. 
this is showing you that you're you're getting a consistent direction uh, from uh, from that well. Uh, as you can see here, you have a scattering. Uh, that might mean that you are in a uh, in an area in the well that you're not you're not getting good flow. So you're not getting a consistent direction in there. So this would not be an area that we would consider to be valuable information. Uh, again, in here, you're getting a solid directional line. It's really good data. And the key that we're trying to point out is what, when you're going down a well and you're looking for a potential plume for contamination, um, what you really want to focus on is preferential flow. I've got a, a variety of, of um, test sites that this has been done on and kind of give you an overview on what we're looking at here. Uh, if you look down at the key here, you can see the stream, it's a blue, and there's a road here uh, and a building here. So what you might see in this is that you're looking at your water generally flowing uh, potentially downstream, similar to the direction that, that the, uh, the stream would be. But if you look at this potential one here, uh, there's an outlier. Uh, perhaps something in this building is causing a draw or something something underground, some type of different formation uh, might be causing the water to change direction. But in general, you can see that you're having a flow to the northeast on this particular site. This would be an example of different fractures that are in the rock. Anything that has an S on it here, that indicates swirling. Swirling would not be an area that we would be looking for for preferential flow. Uh, but if you look at these other depths here, you can see that, you know, Perhaps at, at 106, this is this is a good a good place to look and to uh, to take your reading as to where you might be going. Here is another setup, uh, another testing site that was on the Mississippi River. Again, we have many of the points are flowing towards the river here, just with a couple outliers. Third site here would be um, these are monitoring wells. Again, you can see the S's here. Um, you have a consistency of a flow that looks to be, I'm thinking just looking at the key, that looks to be southeast um, with a few outliers and then a couple wells that they've indicated are swirling, which would not be good data. This is just an example of, sorry the colors are not that great, but if you look here you can see this would be the surface of the water and then you have different ge uh, geological features uh, underground. So typically if you're looking at a slope, uh, you would normally think that the water is just going to be flowing downhill. But if you have different features, uh, different types of rock underground that are upcroppings or things like that, or you have a perched aquifer, uh, you may find uh, different, different flow and velocity directions based on what's happening underground. Here's another example of a monitoring well. And what it's showing here is that you're having different, slightly different directions uh, based on different times of the year. So perhaps if you are in an area like I am in Florida uh, where you, you have a rainy season and then you have a dry season, uh, your direction of flow uh, and velocity uh, could be different. So different times of the year you might have different effects based on your conditions on um, where, where your site is. This is a, this is a pretty interesting graph and um, this is tidal influence. So if you're close to an area that uh, the sea rises and falls, what you can do here is you can see that your direction is red and your velocity is blue. So if the tide is coming in, what you have here is you've got a consistent line in here and then as the tide moves in and stabilizes, the water stops moving so you have your velocity and your direction scatter. Uh, as these scatter and then the time and then the tide begins to move back out, you can see that you begin to pick up uh, a different direction from when the tide was coming in, completely 180 degrees, and then the velocity begins to pick up similar to as it was um, when the tide was coming in. Uh, here's just another example, as I mentioned before, a purged aquifer, uh, aquifer that's sitting sitting above, uh, you know, there could be a couple different layers of aquifers here, but you you can have different types of flow that could be all over the place. And this is uh, 
the Sandia North Groundwater uh, Monitoring Wells, uh, where this one came from. And then that's basically, it's just basically a, a quick presentation that I wanted to give you on the product. I'd like to thank everyone who's attended today. And I'd especially like to thank you, Rob, for your time today, for staying back tonight and for an excellent presentation.